Okay, recording is on. Good morning, everyone, to BC310, our course on church and ministry administration. Uh, we have two lectures today, and I hope uh, we'll all find it useful, find it interesting as we um, talk about various things uh, involving uh, the administration and the operation of uh, a church or a ministry. Okay, uh, let's take a moment, please, to just pray together, and then we'll uh, get started. Who'd like to pray with the class? Anyone can pray. Okay, I'll pray. Go ahead, Harrison. Oh, Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for this minute, this moment, this hour. I want to thank you because your word is made flesh. You know, you you bring your word to us, you know, mm -hmm. and it brings light, you know, to understanding. We thank you for the another opportunity that you've given out to us we've got to study your word. And to be better, oh God, at what we do and to bring glory to your name. Mm -hmm. Father, we ask, O oh God, that your Spirit, O oh God, come afresh upon us. Let your Spirit, O oh God, fill everyone, O oh God, that the words we hear, O oh God, will bring life and bring understanding. And Lord, Father, may we not just be the hearers of your word, but, Father, also the doers of your word. Mm. Lord, we thank you for your servants, whom you want to use right now to speak to us. We ask, O oh God, that your Holy Spirit come upon him strongly that the words he speak of God shall not be words of men but words from the throne of grace. We cover this place with the blood of Jesus and we ask for God that let your name alone be glorified. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Um, welcome, everybody. Good morning or uh, very early morning in some parts of the world and maybe it's evening in some parts of the world, but welcome. All right, so we are going step by step in this course on church and uh, ministry administration. And as we uh, keep introducing different parts or different thoughts or ideas, um, I want to encourage you, if at all possible, to think about these things um, in the context of whatever you are able to do right now. So if um, you are, you know, serving in a church or involved in a ministry somewhere, uh, see if you can take these ideas and put them to work. Um, that would be uh, one of the best ways to, you know, learn and to assimilate these ideas. Now, some of you may have already been doing this uh, for some time, so... Uh, in that case, you know, if there's something new, you can try to use it. Um, and some of us, maybe uh, you may not have the opportunity. That's okay, but at least try to understand it. And then, you know, uh, sometime in the near future, when uh, you kind of get into some ministry or church where you have to do something, then, you know, come back to these notes, uh, go through these ideas and see how you can implement them. Right. So the, the whole purpose of this course is uh, to give something very practical to us, which we can all use uh, in, in our churches and ministries. So we're going to quickly review um, a little bit of what we did last uh, week. And then uh, I know I didn't finish up uh, the um, chapter four. So let's quickly review. And then I just want to cover the last part of it. I know last week we had some... Uh, uh, connectivity problem, and so I think uh, at some point um, we lost connection. I will keep my phone with me here and just make sure. Um, yeah, and I hope it doesn't happen again, but anyway. So um, we were talking about uh, ministry organization and uh, structure, and we said that, you know, uh, what for the church or the Christian ministry, 
uh, we need this organizational structure. It's the backbone and um, that supports all the work that, that is being done. But it has to be organized. The, the organization itself should have a structure to it. So we refer to that as the organization structure. And basically, uh, it, it means that the activities uh, and the flow of information, the decision-making process, etc., are very, very clearly defined uh, within the organization. And that's how it's, it's like putting a machine together, if you want to think of it. And everything works together, and then you have the net result or the out outcome. Now, there are different organization structures which we mentioned. You could have divided by functions. You could have divided by divisions, geographical areas, or departments. You could have a flat. You can have a mix or a matrix structure. Uh, we looked at the scriptures. You know, what we see some amazing examples in the Bible. We talked about why we need to do this. Um, we talked about some, you know, our philosophy behind it. That's just be simple, keep it simple, don't make it overly complex. And some questions we can ask ourselves to make sure that the organizational structure, the design of it is good, you know, it's sound, it's 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 serving the purpose. And we need to continuously look at it. Just one simple example where, you know, if people are not adding value, if there are steps in the process that are not meaningful, you know, we need to eliminate them and, you know, be simple. Um, we just looked at, you know, I uh, just sharing some of the things that we have here at APC, what we are trying to put together. I mean, not everything is in place. We're still uh, looking for people and uh, interviewing and setting things up and, you know, growing step by step. But generally, we have an idea of what we're trying to build and what we're trying to put together. So we went through this. And this is where we paused uh, last week. So. Uh, what I wanted to explain was that, uh, especially in Christ in ministry, right, whether it's in the church type setting or some other Christian ministry, you will have spiritual leaders, you will have uh, uh, the professional skills. I mean, people are, you know, you refer to them as a staff or the administrative staff, they are, they are paid staff. And, and in many cases, you will also have volunteers. And uh, very often, the volunteer base is bigger than the number of full-time paid staff. And that's the that's the normal case with with the nonprofit organizations, charity organizations, right? Because we don't want to spend the funds on the administrators administrative or the organization itself, you want to spend the money on the people who are being served. And it's in, in order to make that happen, in most cases, in churches and Christian ministries, there are a lot of volunteers, people who willingly give uh, their time and effort uh, to do the work of that organization. Uh, so we will have, we'll talk about volunteers a little later volunteer management itself is a very big uh, uh, subject you know people study that they basically how do you motivate volunteers how do you take care of volunteers etc and so on and what is very interesting to look at is the interface between staff and volunteers people are paid and those who are not paid how do you get them to work together that itself is a very um, interesting area uh, and that's again you know, people who are doing management and all, they study that a lot. But what I wanted, what I want to share here is a simple uh, a hub and spoke model uh, that we use here uh, at ABC, and I mean, I'm sure many organizations would use this uh, to facilitate volunteer engagement and also to give people the opportunity to be involved in multiple areas, which is what happens usually in a church or in a ministry setting. That means usually one person, one individual, would be involved in multiple areas of ministry. You know, it's not very restrictive. You know, we say, hey, serve wherever you can, and they may end up serving in two, three areas. And similarly, with the staff, 
uh, over the, for the pastors and the staff. The staff are not just supporting, you know, dedicated to one area of ministry. Many times they are actually involved in multiple areas of ministry just for efficiency and, you know, making it cost effective. So then how do you manage that, right? So this, if you keep this in mind, it really helps uh, this model. So you have pastors and ministry leaders. The pastors and ministry leaders, an individual pastor may be involved in multiple areas of ministry. So you see the blue there. So you can think of you know one pastor being involved in more than one area of ministry. Similarly with the gray, the staff, uh, uh, you know, an IT team will support almost all areas of ministry. Media team will support all areas of ministry. You know, so the staff are kind of you know uh, uh, actually supporting. Uh, multiple ministry areas and then you have the volunteer base which is much bigger than the number of pastors or staff and here again a volunteer may you know um, most often a volunteer may be involved in multiple ministry areas and so what happens is you create these these things are called these are ministry areas, so you have what we, we call them as ministry teams. That means it's a group of people, it's a mix of pastors, staff, and volunteers that form a ministry team or a team that takes care of a particular area of ministry, right? But keep in mind that the people in that team could also be part of other teams. So within each ministry team, you've got a team leader who is overall responsible or, or a ministry leader who is overall responsible for that ministry area. And he's got people who are, you know, oh, they've got people serving there. And so, uh, so while you have a core set of people, these people are actually making everything run, all the ministry areas run. And everything works smoothly because uh, it is kind of, uh, fluid people can move across areas and serve and then then you have to look at the efficiency of each ministry area how that works okay we'll get into that uh, in the next chapter uh, but is this uh, concept or this idea or this model uh, simple and understandable any uh, any questions on that uh, let me just pause here everybody's with me on that Okay. Any questions? Any thoughts? Charles, you have a question. Yeah, I was uh, just uh, <coughs> to, to confirm uh, from the Jahaba spoke, um, and I was wondering uh, the the spokes are many. Mm. Each ministry team requires the pastor. Uh, if the pastors are few, mm -hmm. won't you have uh, pastors that would be maybe one pastor is on three ministry teams mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. another pastor is on, uh, maybe on other like two ministry teams? That's uh, there some clarity there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, what you're saying is correct that one pastor can actually be involved in multiple teams. So for example, let me give you here, uh, you, you know Nancy Ramya. She is a associate pastor of one of our church locations. She is also missions uh, coordinator. So she is overseeing missions. She also handles or she used to handle um, what we refer to as our campus elevate. Those were our outreaches to college campuses. Uh, so, and then she also handles a fourth area, a women's conference. So you have one pastor, Nancy. She's actually in four teams, four areas, right? Now, the workload, it, it may seem like a lot, but if you actually look at it, uh, the women's conference, basically it meets uh, the, the conference. There's only one conference happening in the whole year. And then on a monthly basis, you know, I mean, they have a women's group that they interact. And then on a monthly basis, they do prayer, prayer, uh, what do you call it? 
uh, branch chain, right? So that's the one. Campus, uh, which, I mean, we have to stop all that because of COVID, but it, it'll get restarted. Uh, the campus was, again, she had a team and it was delegated, work was delegated uh, and so on. So one pastor involved in multiple uh, ministry areas. And of course, uh, the staff, church staff will support the work, you know, meaning, you know, website needs to be updated, graphics needs to be done, videos need to be done, promotions need to be done, uh, you know, uh, for, for conferences, events, those things. Need to be done. So there are church staff who will do that, but the pastor coordinates with all of them. So you'll have church staff in all four areas. And then you have volunteers. So the volunteers who want to serve in the women's ministry, they, they are part of that. Volunteers who want to serve in the college campus ministry, they are part of that. Volunteers who want to serve in missions, they are part of that. And then, of course, there are volunteers who serve in that church location, APC North. So, you know, they coordinate all of that. So this actually makes it uh, nice because, like you said, we may have only a few pastors, but they're able to oversee uh, multiple areas of ministry. Is that okay? Thank you so much. All right, okay. Any other questions? Uh, it's on that, uh, just to how to organize um, a church or a ministry that brings together spiritual leaders, staff, and volunteers, and then you can you know do multiple areas. Okay. And anyway, I just think about it. It's just one idea, uh, which is very simple and useful. Okay. Let's move forward. So some other thoughts uh, that we have to keep in mind as your church and ministry grows is, you know, initially you organize for a local ministry, right? So example, when you, you know, you start a church or a ministry in a city, uh, the way the structure is, is okay, we're going to serve a congregation that's in the city. All right, so you're organized for that. Or we're going to serve people in that city. So your, your organizational structure is localized. But then, you know, with the grace of God, with the blessing of God, um, the ministry may go beyond that city. It may go to maybe the state or maybe a region or maybe the entire nation. And today, given all the opportunities we have, uh, the ministry actually can reach beyond one nation. It can reach into many nations. So then what you have to do is you start thinking about how do we serve people beyond our local area, you know. So the organizational structure must therefore support the ministry uh, across countries, across nations. And of course, it depends on the kind of ministry that you're doing. Uh, you will therefore need to design or redesign the organizational structure to support what is happening beyond just um, your local area and so on. So for example, you may have to think about uh, different languages, you know, because if, you, if, if God is opening doors across the country or across nations, then obviously, you know, languages are there. So, uh, you know, the, the, the translation of your resources into other languages, uh, then how would you serve people in different parts of the world? So different regions. So generally, you know, organizations talk in terms of regions, like they may, you know, they may talk about the Americas, the Europe, Asia, Asia or Asia Pacific. So they may club, they may break it down, you know, by continents, they make club regions, continents together, uh, so on and so forth. And then they will, they would replicate their structures by those regions. Or you could do it, uh, if, if it's more of a national kind of thing, you can do it in terms of cities and so on. You know, But uh, think about it, right? Your organization must support the growth of the ministry that goes beyond your local area. And one more thought to keep in mind is, and we will talk more about technology, uh, use of technology, is that these days, 
the organization and everything that happens in it it has to be you know this is a, a common phrase you will hear it has to be data driven and it has to be technology enabled that means um, the decisions that are being made the you know various things that are being uh, that are happening within the organization uh, it has to be based on actual data which today in our world is very possible because a lot of the information is being captured retained and then it can be looked at it can be analyzed and decisions are being made made not on some individuals intuition or just like that but it's based on data now of course you know there is the wisdom of god there is a supernatural leading of the holy spirit um, but at the same time we must learn to look at data and there's nothing wrong in uh, doing that and, you know, and, 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 and that's itself a skill for us as believers to learn how to balance data with you know what God is leading us to do and what the Holy Spirit is inspiring you know the simple rule of thumb is we always follow the leading of the Holy Spirit but when there is no specific direction then make your decision based on facts right so you, you always look at the facts you come to your decision but then you submit that decision to the leading of the holy spirit in many cases the holy spirit does want us to use our mind because god designed our mind he gave us the ability to think and reason and so he will lead us with that but there will be times when he tell us to you know overwrite that and then that's when we just step out by faith and follow the leading of the holy spirit right but anyway getting back to this we must learn to be data driven make use of the data that's being collected and analyze it and then you know make decisions and we have to be technology enabled now one of the things that i myself am working with our own church staff and which i think might be a challenge is to help people you know our team people are serving in the church and the ministry see we are doing spiritual ministry but at the same time we must develop professional skills we must develop professional skills so that is something uh, you know it's uh, it's uh, I'm not saying it's a struggle but it's something I'm you know trying to work with our team and slowly develop that side because think about the mindset right those who come to serve in the church or in the ministry uh, of course they all come with a very strong spiritual inclination you know they love God and they love his word they love the ministry of the spirit and they want to see lives transformed and then they come in and step into the organization but then for the organization to function well we need professional skills and we need people who can look at data who can analyze data who can you know there's so much to be done at a professional level and so that's where uh, I find the challenge I find there is a challenge that it's not just uh, spiritual side is very important but we need to constantly grow professionally right and so that to create a culture to help those in the ministry in the organization understand that we have to have professional skills that are relevant to today where organizations are data driven and they're technology enabled right so we'll have to we have to be you know savvy with these things that is a challenge and that's something we are continuing to work on right so we come to the end of this chapter I want to pause and just take your thoughts and comments um, uh, and so on okay I see a question here does the pastor automatically become the leader in each ministry area uh, good question let me just go back to the uh, the organizational chart to kind of answer that question so 
what we have here when, uh, is that the pastor, the senior pastor, is overall in charge of everything, like overall responsibility. So, you know, here are all the ministry areas. So the ministry leader, there are different ministry areas here. There's a ministry leader. So every ministry area is, is a, the person who's actually responsible is the ministry leader. They make the decisions, they run it, they do it. But they will refer back to, you know, the, the pastor, the senior pastor, uh, as and when needed, right? So as senior pastor, I've, I, you know, I would just, you know, be more in the background, um, more to make sure that that ministry area is staying, going in a certain direction. So we would in interact, we would talk regularly with the ministry leaders, hey, how are things going? For example, you know, um, uh, uh, let's take the men's conference. Okay, the men's conference. Um, you know, uh, so I, the, the you know the person who's heading that up, I will talk. Okay, for this year, you know, let's this will be the theme, and we will have the speakers, and you know, so just de talk with that, discuss that. Then thereafter, the person in charge men's conference go get it done, and then what what are the outcomes you want to see, and from there, you know, what do we want to do? So we discuss that. But the person in charge, the ministry leader in charge men's conference, is the one who's actually going to get everything done and you know carry it out. So that's how we work. So, you know, while the uh, the the senior pastor is at, at a high level, you know, overseeing things, they're not actually involved in the in what actually happens, right? Because the people in the team will get it done and will run with that ministry, and they will make all the decisions. Okay, go ahead, Elisha. You have a follow up question. Yes, Pastor. Thank you very much for, for the feedback. Um, I asked the question with a background of uh, my denomination, where um, almost all our ministries um, at the national level, we have basically four levels. We have the national level, the area level, the district level and the local uh, level. Mm. Aside, apart from the local and the district level, the area and the national level, all our ministries are led by pastors. They are led by full-time ministers. Mm. Mm. Yes, and they are supported by uh, volunteers. So they make the team at the leadership uh, ministries leadership level initially it wasn't so initially at the area district level um and even at the national level it was led by volunteers mm. volunteers elders can head the ministries however um i i actually don't know the the thoughts that went into that decision but at the time, it was reversed, and ministers, full-time ministers, were made to lead the ministries. From personal observation, I've realized that it has its advantages and disadvantages, where sometimes um, uh, the pastor. Uh, based on the, the his leadership style will have influence on the ministry or positive influence on the ministry or a negative mm. influence and you, you see um sometimes how volunteers relate with their pastor when volunteers they are one of their own is leading the team the relationship is different mm. and when it is being led by a pastor the relationship is also different. Yes, that that's, that was from the background. That's why I asked the question. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the ideal, I mean, this is my thoughts. The ideal is that we can 
so develop and empower people and just give them complete freedom uh, in their areas of ministry so that you know because each one uh, you know can grow and fulfill what God wants to do that would be ideal and of course you know the pastors are there to just oversee to make sure things are on track to discuss the vision and provide some input and guidance and then give give people the full freedom so that they can really carry things out I mean that would be the ideal way uh, to work uh, but you know uh, it varies depending like you said on on the organization the leadership style of the leaders themselves yeah all right uh, I'm sure we're going to be coming back to some of these things uh, as we go along as we get into the details these things will come up again on the dynamic of you know working with people and so on so we can revisit some of these things I'm going to move forward uh, to the next chapter and uh, as we so we talked a little bit about chapter four we talked about the organizational structure the design of the organization and the um, the importance of you know today in today's world even Christian organizations or churches have to be data driven and technology enabled which means that um, uh, those in the organization although we are doing spiritual work we still need professional skills and that's something we need to continuously work on and uh, you know and that's one of the reasons why we are having some of these courses as part of the Bible College that is you now we want our students they're going to be doing ministry but they need to have some understanding of you know ministry administration organization um, next next year we'll do a course on uh, media and technology you know so again you just need that you know uh, these days uh, it's all a, a necessary part of uh, doing ministry so it's uh, we want you to have these skills all right let's move forward in chapter five uh, as part of your having of you know building your church ministry church ministry or organization it's important for the organization to have documented administrative policies guidelines and standards that means the organization is writing down and is having it in a written way saying this is how we are going to work Okay, these are our policies. That means this is how we make decisions, or th this is the philosophy, this is our guiding principle in making decisions. Um, these are our operational guidelines. That means when teams work, when different departments or units are working, they need to follow these guidelines, and these are our standards. That means when you're actually producing something this is how it has to be done right so you've got policies that guide the overall decisions at a high level you've got uh, guidelines operational guidelines that should tell you how things have to be done and you've got standards that dictate essentially the quality of things that have to be done and these have to be documented that means it has to be written somewhere so that people can go to it uh, look at it uh, you know and and of course these things will we have to keep updated we have to keep reviewing updating uh, revising from time to time but why do we need that because it will help establish efficiency there'll be consistency we also know who's responsible for what and therefore we can hold people accountable to what has been stated right so i remember you know uh, i was in some place in india was ministering at a conference and then uh, usually during break time you know we just uh, there's at a pastor's conference and during break time tea time lunch time we'll just be casually sitting having conversation with pastors and so it's it's nice 
And there were once one pastor came, he said, you know, I have a problem. Okay, what's the problem? He said, see, uh, I just uh, hired uh, one person from my church as uh, as an ad to help with administration. But this person, uh, they come, I think it was a lady, I forget it exactly now. He, he or she, uh, let's say, was, you know, he comes whenever he wants. He leaves the office whenever he wants. And uh, he takes his own time to do the work. And uh, now I am afraid to correct him. I said, uh, why? And of course he's afraid because this person is also a member of the church. And he doesn't want any misunderstanding with this person. So he said, look, I'm finding it, finding it very difficult. What am I supposed to do? So now just think of it. It's actually a very funny situation because there's only one person that the pastor wanted to engage as a staff uh, in the office, church office, to help with some administrative work. And with this one person itself, there's so much of stress already because that person comes to the office whenever they want and they leave the office whenever they want and they take their own time to get work done, etc. So then I asked a simple question. I said, you know, do you have some sort of a document like, you know, uh, an offer letter when you hired this person, did you state, you know, uh, what, what are your work hours? How many hours a week should this person work? And what are the things they are supposed to be doing? I said, no, I just told them start, they started. You know, so then, then we had to go through the very basic thing of, okay, see, you need to put all this down in a letter and a document, make it very clear and you get them to sign it before they start work then you will not have this problem. You know, you tell them you have to be in the office from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m., Monday through Friday. They have to work eight hours a day, 40 hours a week. This is their responsibility. If you have it written down, get them to sign it up before they start. There is absolutely no issues, you know. So very simple. The solution actually is very simple. But if you don't have something written, if you don't have a policy or a guideline or a standard, it can become such a big stressful thing uh, unnecessarily okay it's such a simple example but the the fact of the matter is many churches and christian organizations they run like this you know they don't think about the importance of documentation of having uh, things properly documented and so on and so um, so it's we need to understand the importance of it so uh, why is it important for us to have these policies, guidelines, practice standards. Like we said, it provides guidance for the organization, the people are working in it. Uh, it clarifies the organization's position on specific issues, like how are we going to work, for example, uh, how are we going to work with new vendors? So, you know, if, example, if you want uh, somebody to provide a certain kind of service for the organization, let's say, to somebody who will be your, uh, who will be providing your sound, sound, you know, equipment for your event, or be doing the um, the the stage lighting and media, whatever. Yeah, there are so many vendors you may want to interact with. On what basis would you select a vendor? So, because you could select, there could be three or four vendors, and then you don't want any vendor trying to influence the decision maker in your organization you know uh, so you don't want any thing to happen that way so what should you do you have a vendor services agreement that states you know these are things that the vendor should meet are uh, these are criteria and then based on that you know there's a decision making process and this is how you make your vendor choose your vendor and go forward uh, so the when you have written policies and guidelines, it helps in making decisions. And then there is great objectivity, consistency, and fairness uh, in decision making. That means people are, people know that you're not making decisions just based on your own whim and fancy, but you're making a decision based on certain actual stated criteria, right? So there is no, uh, so you're, you know, the decision is fair to everybody. And also, when you have something written down, you can hold people accountable to that. You know, say, look, this is what we wanted to do. Have you done it? 
you know, uh, so there's that sense of accountability. Otherwise, um, people will not be answerable for their work. And very important, everything must be written and available, right? So it's got to be documented. It's got to be accessible. People should know, okay, I can go and look at it here, right? So have them written down, be simple and clear, be specific and detailed so that there's no ambiguity or misinterpretation. Communicate, you know, what are the principles, motivations, uh, uh, and uh, so you're providing the principle and motivation because, you know, we, have, we won't know this, all the scenarios people will have to, people would encounter. So if they know the principle, they know the motivation, then they can make a decision in various scenarios. Make it available to people in the organization and then reiterate, review, and revise. Right? That means you go over this over and over again because people tend to forget. And so we need to revisit these things from time to time. Okay. So let me pause here before I show you, you know, examples of what we have here at APC. Um, you know, let's just think together. What will happen if there were no policies, guidelines, and standards in a Christian organization, so in a church? So in a church setting, think about this. In a church setting, if you didn't have this, you know, you had a whole bunch of full-time pastors, you had church staff, uh, you're all working together, but, uh, you know, there's no policy, there's no guideline, there's no standards. All right, let's do ministry. Uh, what would happen? What do you think? Go ahead. Please share your thoughts, Elijah. Yeah, um, Pastor. I think in the situation, uh, there there could be chaos. Um, everybody does what pleases him. Mm -hmm. um, there is no identity for the organization. Just as you cited the the example that a chess staff reports to work um, at his will. Mm -hmm. He takes time to do the work when it pleases him. Mm -hmm. And there will be no efficiency. Exactly. There will be no efficiency. There will be a lot of waste. There will be a lot of waste in the system. Mm. Yes. True. Very good. Very good. Good thoughts. Thank you. Uh, yep. I see some of the thoughts coming in the chat as well. Good thoughts. Thank you. Kennedy, I see your hand. <laughs> Charles says the government will arrest the pastor. <laughs> right. Go ahead, Kennedy. I think there'll be a lot of confusion. There'll be a lot of uh, responsibility. There'll be no accountability. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And hence, they think that will lead to more divisions in the church. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. True. Yeah. And uh, like, uh, go ahead. Kennedy has something more to say? Oh, no, okay. And um, uh, so, uh, you know, and really, people will start going in different directions, you know? So the organization overall will not make any progress because people are going in different directions. People may be contradicting each other in decisions. Um, and uh, you know it it is it will be like what you know some some of you have said it's going to be chaos and yeah of course the organization can get into some serious trouble uh, and uh, you know people can get into trouble yes and i see yeah rose i see what rose said no growth or multiplication yeah so things just stagnate there's no progress nothing happens okay so Good. And so I think all of us can understand uh, the importance of you know having st well stated, well documented policies, and guidelines and standards. You know, and yes, erosion saying uh, the vision of the organization will not be achieved. Right? You, you, uh, the organization will not be making progress, not be fulfilling what it's there for. Good. Very good thoughts. So. Um, Let's go back now and uh, we'll move forward here. So, you know, so what are the kinds of things that you need to have um, as an organization? So 
I'll just share some of the things that I, I feel are, I mean, you know, we can list out a lot and depending on how big the organization is and what all they're doing, there could be lots of policies. Um, but I'll just uh, state a few here and um, I'll share a few thoughts. So uh, at a very basic level, you know, we need what is referred to as staff and consultant guidelines. That means uh, these are policies for people who are who are employed or paid by the organization, right? Now, um, um, well, let me just pause here. So, what I'm going to refer you to is uh, ipcwo.org slash guidelines. Okay. So you can go to this uh, web page anytime and vpcw.org uh, slash guidelines. So on this web page, we've put out all our guidelines. Okay, so let me just um, share that with you. Uh, I mean, just show it to you now, and then you could um, you could definitely go there and. Uh, you know, ha have a look at it later on when you when you have uh, um, some time. Can you see uh, the uh, APCW.org guidelines page now? Oh, can you see it? Or you can't? Uh, I'm not sure. Pastor, we can see a page where it's administrative policies and staff and consultant guidelines are just given as a topic. Okay, so you're seeing the PDF. Okay. All right. And let me just go back to. Okay. Seeing the PDF. I'll share my entire screen so you'll be able to see everything. Okay, so now you can see the apcw.org guidelines slash guidelines. You can see the guidelines web page. Right? So if you go online to apcw.org slash guidelines, so now we can see the guidelines web page, right? With all the documents. Okay. It's faster seeing it. Okay, in, they're in red. Yeah. Yes, thank you. All right, so you know you're welcome to take any of these and you know modify it and use it. But here's what I wanted to show you. So we have these guidelines for different areas of ministry. Right? These are just simple, you know, one two page documents, but they are uh, they uh, they're updated from time to time. And uh, you know, when somebody wants to know, you know, for example, uh, FTV stands for first time visitor. So for a first time visitor, if they want to be a part of the first time as a team, you know, what are the guidelines to be part of this team, right? They can go look at it up, uh, look it up here. And then usually when somebody's inducted to the team, they, they kind of, they go through it periodically to teach them, you know, okay, this is what you do. And so like this, you have different um, areas of ministry, all right? Then, you have uh, the team guidelines for uh, training documents. We want to train and so on. So I just wanted to um, show this to you, staff and consultant guidelines. So if you look at it now, this is our staff and consultant guidelines. Uh, and so when somebody is going to join us as a staff, uh, we tell them to read this and before they sign up as a staff or a consultant. Right, so it basically says, okay, this is our vision, this is who we are, this is our destiny, this is what we're called to do. Uh, you know, this organization structure; these are our core values as an organization. Um, a little explanation on that. Uh, this is our culture as an organization, and this is the culture we want to maintain. We'll talk about workplace culture a little later on. We explain to them, you know, hey, this is what what we want to maintain. This is what we want to avoid. And then we have a code of conduct. So we want to make sure that all our staff and 
uh, 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 consultants you know who are working for example we definitely say you know no, no alcohol no smoking these kinds of things uh, uh, you know and what do we see there has been integrity accountability and so on uh, we have to keep information confidential we give them access to our database uh, which has you know people's information you have to keep all of that confidential some basic uh, dress code things like that uh, how do you how in you know, hiring resignation termination uh, we have staff and we have consultants and then we have people who are interns or trainees uh, what are the work hours weekly hours office hours you know lunch break personal work you know punctuality work from home how do you report your time how will you get paid uh, and uh, you know reimbursements for work related expenses what are the leaves you can take um, all the holidays and so on uh, uh, when you're going out of uh, and if you want to go on unpaid leave what are the benefits for our staff you know, these are the benefits you have got your bonus your health insurance you have your retirement fund and um, you know uh, how do you do your expense claim that is if you spend money for on work related things how do you get it back um, uh, some guidelines on interacting with church people uh, you know you have to be careful um, we have counseling available for everyone um, uh, uh, and how, 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 are, how are people going to be paid so you know we tell them look we value your skills there's performance reviews um, these are the criteria on which you're going to be uh, reviewed uh, at uh, how, how it'll happen and this is what uh, you you can expect as an increment based on performance uh, this is how your bonus is going to be calculated every year uh, and then you know there is in case of emergency you need some salary in advance this is how much we can provide um, then the spiritual work related daily devotions we give them free access to Bible college courses free access to weekend schools uh, uh, they can attend conferences, seminars. Uh, we give uh, give them money for doing their own courses and so on. And however, some guidelines on our communication standards, um, you know, confidentiality, uh, confidentiality and security of data, ministry of leave. That means you can't take time to go work and serve in other ministries and things like that. You know. Um, uh, workplace culture how to be cultivated so basically I mean this is a long document but when we when somebody joins us as a staff or a consultant we give them this document so they read it so everything is clear before they join right so in case they don't like they don't like something they don't want to join at least they can make that decision before they sign up so this is one example so like that there are you know different documents here and then these are the role descriptions you know what is expected of you when you're working at APC so everybody who's a staff or a consultant is is is, is one of these roles you know and so they can go here and they can say okay you know as a uh, let's say uh, children's church assistant pastor okay children's church so this is your role you know this is what you need to be doing uh, this is what we expect of from you and uh, what are the skills that are required there'll be additional responsibilities and these are your opportunities etc so it's a short paid document but it makes it clear what they're supposed to be doing now in some cases the role may be a little bit more you know uh, uh, a little bit more detailed or involved uh, where example as a pastor you know okay we are, uh, you're going to be responsible for all of these things and this go you know so it's a little bit more involved but we spell it out so so we have all of this here what i would want you know i'd encourage you to just go go to this place take any of these documents modify it as you want to suit your church ministry and you know feel free to use it we put it out here because all our people can go and you know our staff volunteers others can go there and uh, make use of that from time to time all right so um, let me 
Okay, I need to pause here. That we're already into our break time. Um, okay, so um, we will pause here. I, I'm sorry, I kind of spilled over into our break time. Uh, we'll come back and pick it up from here, okay? So let's go for a break. We'll be back in 10 minutes. Thank you. <laughs> 